good morning children uh, it's morning so i'm saying good morning it can be good day as well so uh, i think you had gone through this the previous video of french revolution so today we will start with a new chapter and that is socialism in europe that is the second chapter of your history book socialism in europe and the russian revolution now this is a very very interesting chapter a very interesting chapter and a very 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 important chapter for your uh, entrances that uh, would take place in the future so please be attentive please be careful i'll be explaining the chapter to you to the best of my abilities uh, in the medium of through the medium of uh, recording or online so that is uh, we are giving our best we know that so uh, let's start the chapter you must have heard a uh, few words so first of all i would like to explain you the meaning of those words so that you can understand the chapter well the first word is capitalism capitalism means the industries the economic sector of a country of a state is privately owned uh, there is a minimum or nil government control uh, and most of all in most of the countries capitalist countries there is a democracy now opposite to capitalism there is a system called socialism or communism now socialism and communism are two different philosophies but at the level of ninth class you may take them as one so it is just the opposite in capitalism the industries are privately owned but in socialism or communism they are owned by the government the state uh, there is a in capitalism uh, there is no or minimum or no government control but in socialism or communism there is complete government control and uh, mostly capitalism is a one party system so the entire world was a capitalist world and uh, uh, even russia was capitalist under the dynasty tsar uh, sometimes we call zar sometimes european books use the term t s a r tsar we uh, pronounce it tsar t is silent right now let's go to russia and let me discuss russia before 1900s it was a uh, agricultural economy uh, agrarian economy where 85% of the people were in agriculture sector they were peasants or uh, were farmers so they used to till the land and grow crops and thus they that was their subsistence uh, industry was there but that was in pockets that means it was not a fully industrial nation so uh, like st petersburg moscow vladivostok and other uh, uh, small uh, areas were industrialized so mainly broadly it was an agricultural country now russia was facing the people of russia were facing a lot of problems the problem was uh, because of severe very severe a winter because most of the russia lies in the north pole zone right so winters were very uh, are very severe and uh, there was no government help to the farmers and the crops uh, got uh, deteriorated the their growth very quickly and uh, subsistence crisis was there in industrial sector uh, workers were made though there were laws of uh, wage laws that uh, how much wage has to be paid or the laws uh, regarding uh, working hours but it was not followed right so workers instead of working for 8 to 10 hours they had to work for 16 to <coughs> 18 hours right and uh, there was no sanitation there was no housing the children of the workers did not have any education so the condition and the tsar the dynasty tsar like we have mughals like we have uh, uh, guptas and mauryas so it was a dynasty called tsar t s a r so it was not doing much for the people the people were feeling alienated from the government in russia now uh in 1770s a capitalist person uh viewed the problems of the labor right and he introduced a system called socialism now socialism we owe this concept to a person called robert owen w w e n robert owen so he wanted through socialism 
regulation of working hours, more power to the workers, more uh, concessions to the workers, better uh, living conditions for the workers, better education to their children, better sanitation to their children and themselves, uh, means the workers. So that was socialism. So slowly, the socialist ideas, and it was in the United States of America, traveled to Europe, this idea. And most of the countries like uh, Germany, Poland, Denmark, Spain, Portugal, uh, even uh, Czechoslovakia, that was one country at that time, uh, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, uh, Norway, Iceland, Finland, these countries also started, a group of people started adopting socialism there, and socialist parties were being created over there. Right. So, like there was SPD party in Germany, so small uh, people, portion of people uh, tried getting into socialist ideas against capitalist system. Now, let's come back to Russia. As I've already told you, 85% of the Russian population was peasantry, and uh, they uh, they were deprived of all the uh, things that are required for a good life. And the Tsar regime wasn't uh, helping them much. The government wasn't helping them. At that time, the ruler was Tsar Nicholas II. Right, the name of the ruler, Tsar is the dynasty, Nicholas II was the ruler. Uh, the workforce force contained 31% of women, though the women suffered a lot. They were not given equal pay as their male counterparts. They were given uh, half or three-fourths of the wages that were being uh, uh, dispatched or given to the workers, of male workers, right? And the women did not have rights. They were exploited at home and at workplace, and a lot of problem was there. Religion played a great role, and it was a Roman Catholic country, and a lot of very big chunks of land in Russia belonged to the church. Means the church was the owner of big land, uh, and was very, very, very moneyed. And it was not like today. It was an exploitative institution. It used to exploit people. Right. Uh, the church uh, owned a lot. And the people were suffering, and the church people, and the nobility was enjoying life. You can I recollect the French society as well in this. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1878, uh, some people who were uh, impressed with the socialist ideas established a political party. Though the political parties were banned in Russia before 1914, a secret political party was made, the Social Democratic Workers' Party. That is called also the Communist Party in Russia. But it organized itself and it worked very uh, secretly because political parties were banned in Tsarist Russia, the Russia of Tsar, Nicholas II. So they, they could not operate independently. So they had to uh, work secretly. Right. Now, the communists in Russia are divided into two sections. One, the Bolsheviks, and the other, the Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks were the part of the Communist Party. Listen carefully. The Bolsheviks were the part of the Communist Party, the Workers' Party, Socialist Party, who believed in a closed organization with very few people in the cadre and a disciplined system where not everybody is allowed. Bolsheviks. And the other ones are Mensheviks. Mensheviks uh, believed that anybody any anybody who is tilted towards socialism may be made the part of the party. So slowly there was a wide gap or difference between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Right. So uh, and the more influential people were the Bolsheviks. Uh, they held more power in uh, the country and they were more influential. Bolsheviks. Why I'm saying this? Because you will learn later that Bol Bolsheviks were the people who actually uh, brought the revolution. Uh, now, let's come to 1904. And 1904 was a very, very disturbing and uh, horrendous year. Bad year for Russia. Severe winters, heavy snowfall, all the crops 
failed. Uh, factories were closed. There were massive strikes. No worker, no peasant had any amount of money to buy even a loaf of bread for themselves and their families. Widespread poverty, starvation, epidemic uh, were happening every now and then because of the dead bodies that were being thrown in the river Volga. So all these problems amalgamated together in 1904. And thus, now remember this era, 1905, 1905, few people under the father of a church started moving on a Sunday in February to the palace of Tsar Nicholas II that is also known as the Winter Palace, St. Petersburg. They started moving. So when they started moving, they just had in their mind that they will want to talk to their king and want to convey their plight to the king and want some confessions from him. But Tsar Nicholas II thought that these people are coming to harm him and he ordered his troops to fire on that group of people which contained males, men, women as well as children. The military of Tsar opened fire on that peaceful group. More than 100 people died and more than 300 were wounded and this shook the entire, not only the entire Russia but the world. The innocent people were killed without any retaliation from their side. This, it happened on Sunday. So this in history is called the event of Bloody Sunday. This event is called Bloody Sunday. And the year, uh, the, this event is also known as the Revolution of 1905 or the Revolution of 1905. Just remember this very carefully. Now, after 1905, the uh, people uh, started believing that the king won't help them. So, they, all of them started tilting towards the Communist Party or the Socialist Democratic Workers' Party. The king became fearful that the entire janta, the entire citizens of uh, Russia are tilting towards the Communist Party. So, he had to agreed to a demand of the people and that is creation of a body that contains the representatives of the people so that they can advise, aid and advise the king in making any decision though the king did not want but he had to. This organization, it was like a parliament where the representative of common people existed is called Duma, D-U-M-A, Duma. Now king within 75 days suspended the Duma, made another Duma, and then a third Duma. Why this change? Because King wanted, he was very clever, in fact he was foxy, King wanted all the Duma members to belong to the people who support him. So the Duma members were aristocrats, nobles, rich landlords, rich peasants, who were not a part of the public that was actually suffering and why this type of a Duma was created to give a assurance to the people, false assurance that yes we have found, we found a Duma so don't worry your representatives are here but actually they all were the supporters of the king. Right. Now uh, the things went on and on and strikes, hartals, small rebellions, uprisings uh, took place hither and thither, especially in southern part of Russia. I'm talking about the years between 1905 and 1917. Uh, now in 1914, a very big world event took place and that was the First World War. The First World War took place between two camps. One was Allied Pass, that is uh, Britain, France and Russia. And the other one was central powers like uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Serbia. Most of the casualties, the people who died, more than 6 million, were Russians. And Tsar had to put new taxes and put new pressure, economic burden on the people to sustain itself, Russia, in the war. 
so that they don't lose the war, but they lost the war. Many a time, but they continued fighting. So the common person thought that if we are, we are not getting anything out of it. It is the war between European countries. Why? Though I, I, I admit that Russia is also a European country, but Russia is away from that part of Europe, actual Europe. Most of its 90 percent of its part lies in Asia. But it is a European country because its capital Moscow is in Europe. So we see where the capital lies. We say that country is in that continent. So why the Tsar is has put the life of people the on stake in the First World War when they don't have to gain anything? The gainer would be Tsar. He would be the king. He would be the the winner. But the common person wasn't able to gather anything. Now, in 1917, it was February, when Duma was again suspended, and this time Duma got the support of the people and launched a nationwide, whole Russia uprising of the workers and peasants and all the rich and poor people who wanted Tsar to go and communism or socialism to come. And this in history is called the February Revolution. As soon as this happened, Tsar Nicholas II fled. He fled and ran away with his family. And the rule of Russia came in the hands of the Duma or the socialist. Right. Now be very careful. That Duma which took the rule of February, contained of rich people, aristocrats, nobles, uh, rich landlords, rich people who were above the general classes. So they did not make any decision in the favor of the common Russian. And the Russians supported them because they were expecting that the new socialist government would be doing much good to them, but nothing of that sort happened. Now the leader of the another section, the Bolsheviks, was Vladimir Ulyich Ulyanov, that you all, that the commonly we know as Lenin. Lenin was in exile. Exile means he had to leave Russia. He came back when he heard that Tsar's rule has gone and the rule of Duma has come, and brought out his three main points that in history is called April Thesis. April Thesis is a combination of three points that Lenin brought and said that if we will take over the rule, these three points we will uh, bring into effect immediately. ASAP. Number one, we will step back from the First World War. We will step back. We won't be a party of the First World War. We will withdraw. Number two, all the banks shall be nationalized. And number three, land to the tiller. All the land that was under big landlords would be distributed to the people, to the farmers, to the poor farmers who are tilling or working on them. So this is called April Thesis. These three points are called April Thesis that came in April 1917. 1917 in Russia. Uh, now, Lenin was getting a lot of support from the peasantry as well as workers because the Duma government, which called itself socialist but did not do anything, its leader was uh, Kerensky, uh, was not, had not done anything. So another revolution took place in 1917 October and that is also called Bolshevik Revolution or October Revolution. Right. Now, you have to understand this fact very clearly. Tsar was brought down by February Revolution Duma, but Duma was brought down by October Revolution by the Bolsheviks under the leadership of Lenin. So actually the communism, the socialist government in Russia came in October 1917. So when somebody asks you later stage in any entrance exam, 
what does russian revolution mean russian revolution mean february revolution plus the october revolution but actual revolution is october revolution which is also called bolshevik revolution so it made russia actually a communist country or a socialist country and lenin became the leader of the government with socialism and immediately he ordered the three points of the april thesis to take place there so land was given to the poor peasants all the banks were nationalized and uh, russia withdrew from the war it was in a very bad condition financial condition but lenin was uh, assured that he could do something for the people now i think i did not mention this is a very important point i forgot that who has given the philosophy of communism communism means workers rule there is no worker there is no owner all the owners are workers and all the workers are owners so there is no distinction of class everybody is one this philosophy of communism is was given by karl marx a german political scientist born in 1818 and frederick engels his uh, partner and they wrote a book in 1848 the communist manifesto right that had got a a lot of influence on the 1917 revolution karl marx and frederick engels communism this is sometimes also called marxism now uh, a lot of changes occurred after the october revolution as i told you april thesis and uh, massive industrialization was done workers were given 8 uh, hours working time they were given good wages peasants were given subsidies they were uh, made to work for less hours government was supporting them in everything so russia became a communist country uh, ruled by workers and peasants for the workers by the workers and of the workers and the peasants right okay now the duma or the supporters of the this uh, country got divided into three types of people initially also now i want to take you back to uh, before the russian revolution russia had three kinds of groups one was liberals who wanted to change the society but they wanted the king to remain but the king shall be answerable to the people the other ones were radicals who wanted the king to uh, go all together and uh, a democracy should come and the third ones were uh, autocratic or so aristocratic they just wanted the king to remain there right uh, they were called conservatives now uh, after the revolution again the russia got divided into three parts one was uh, the whites who supported the king czar the other one uh, were uh, okay I'll, let's make it simpler one whites who supported czar czar the king the erstwhile king and the other reds the communists now czar requested in from exile while he was hiding austria hungary at that time they were as the same country austria hungary britain france po um, spain portugal all these countries that and all them that dear respective kings that brothers today what i am going through tomorrow you may also go go through because europe is embracing socialism help me help me fight against the communist forces the red army of the bolsheviks so that i again take over the reign become the king again so and then when your time you will be in difficult times i'll be coming and helping you so from 19 uh, say 18 to 1922 or broadly to 23 a civil war took place in russia right uh, communist russia socialist russia on one side was tsar and all the foreign countries that were supporting king and on the other hand the russians who had formed red army the common russians right the communist and the socialist russians this war went on and on and on and until 1922 23 the red army emerged victorious and russia was formally 
made uh, into a socialist and communist country and renamed the Soviet Union or Union of Soviet Socialist Republic that is called USSR. Right from 1917 onwards, you can say Russia was known as USSR. Now, after Lenin, a very, very powerful person took over the throne of Russia and he was comrade Joseph Stalin. And Stalin was the leader of Russia or USSR or Soviet Russia in the Second World War as well. So, so Stalin uh, was a very staunch person, dictatorial person, who introduced many new things like five-year plans that India adopted, that we will make a budget, a plan for the coming five years and do everything for those five years. He also introduced a system called collectivization or call cost. Now, what is collectivization? See, if we, if there, is a, there are small parcels of lands and individual farmers are farming on their own small patch of land, the, the produce will be less. But if we join all those small patches of land and make it a big land, the produce will be more. And all the peasants who are working on that would be given the dear share in ratio to the land on which they are working. So this system of collectivizing or bringing together small patches of land and making it a huge land under the government is called collectivization or call cause. So this was a, a, a very tremendous achievement and Russia really did very well in agriculture and industrial sector between 1926-27 uh, until 1991. It became one of the world's par, right? Um, at par or somewhat at par with the United States of America. It became a very powerful country. So the world got divided into two poles, two parts, one USA and the other USSR. It became such a strong country. Now, uh, this is in nutshell what is meant by socialism in Europe uh, or Russian revolution. Now, now I'm coming to uh, the end of the chapter. Causes or impact of the Russian revolution on the world. Very important topic. Number one. Books were written, speeches were made, but no country practically has ever experienced communism or socialism. So USSR, Russia, was the first country to bring socialism practically at practical level as a government system. People used to talk about it, people used to sing songs about it. People used to write books on it, but nobody has experienced it, how it would be like. So Russia was the first country. Number two, uh, it gave the strength to the workers of the entire world and the peasants of the entire world that though we don't have power, we don't have arms, we don't have ammunition, we don't have support, but if we become a group, if we come together, we can defeat any, any, any person, any group, any power. So it gave the workers and peasants of the entire world the confidence. Third, and during 1920s, most of the Afro-Asian countries, African-Asian countries were under their imperialist powers, like India was under Britain. So this revolution gave a push to the Indian leaders, and I want to name them, you'll read in class 10 as well, third chapter, like Jawaharlal and Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose, that if they can illiterate, powerless people, why can't we come together, be unified and in unison fight against the British Empire or any empire that is ruling any European country, ruling any African or Asian country. Next, it uh, introduced many new systems that were adopted by many countries later, like collectivization, like five-year plan, like uh, a budget that relied upon the labor, 
classless society where there's no class all the workers are the owners as well and of the owners are working so there is no owner or worker distinction right and equality egalitarianism where everybody can be treated equally so these type of moral feelings moral um, virtues were offered to the world by the russian revolution fifthly you can say that uh, people realized that they don't need foreign investment foreign power or the help of king or technicians or technologically advanced countries or science and technology or phd's in getting developed even the people who are illiterate even the people who are powerful a power less sorry may change their fortune by adopting new methods according to their celebration mindset and experiment experience and be successful so the poor countries of the world got the strength that they may use their own resources human resources and uh, geographical resources to develop themselves right so this was the impact of the russian revolution global impact on every uh, everybody so this in nutshell completes your second chapter of history class 9 history book and that is called socialism in europe and the russian revolution uh again i'll say after seeing this video or while you're seeing this video you can play it once or twice or thrice that's why videos are always more beneficial than online classes uh flip the pages of the book icon alongside and then if there is any doubt i'll uh, try to address it asap i'll let you know so stay safe stay home enjoy with family and don't stop learning god bless you all